Welcome to Truth in History. God's true people, Israel. Revelation of God's plan. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Mystery of God shall be finished. Kingdoms become kingdoms of Christ. Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome once again to Truth in History and to our series entitled Jeremiah the Weeping Prophet. Why would the Lord choose a man and give him a weeping heart? But that's the prophet of Jeremiah that we see his book and we read his words in the Bible. And most likely one of the most neglected books in the Bible because there's a lot of gloom and doom in the book. Because we have committed the same, we, America, have committed the same sins of ancient Judah. Now, very quickly, once again, Jeremiah was a young man, and he began his ministry during the reign of King Manasseh. And King Manasseh filled Jerusalem with the blood of the innocent. In other words, he killed more babies. He aborted more babies or he allowed it to happen. And that was Baal worship. In other words, they gave their children to Baal and burned them in the fire. And then, you know, they uh, had people beating drums to drown out the cries of these uh, burning babies. Well, these days, we don't hear the cries of aborted babies because the courts are the drums. They protect the abortion mills. They protect the abortionist and give them a status. And you can hear the, uh, see the women in the streets carrying signs, this is my body. Um, but they have, according to them, a right to do anything with their body that they want, even kill their children. Well, so we're living in a duplicate age in which Jeremiah lived. We're living in a duplicate age. This is disturbing, folks. I'm not sure how many Preachers or pastors or evangelists are crying out against the sins of the nation. But will it help? But it will serve as a witness on the day of judgment that there's something wrong. Well, let's go back to the book of Jeremiah. Chapter number 2, verse number 26 as the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, saying to a stock, in other words, to a, a tree stump, Thou art my father, and to a rock or a stone, thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble they will arise they will say, Arise and save us. Now, what is this prophet saying? What does this verse mean? Saying to a stock or a tree stump, which was an idol, and to a stone that they had carved, these brought us out of Egypt. These are the gods that made us rich. These are the gods that brought great prosperity to our nation. These are the gods that have built America, not Jesus Christ, not the Christian religion. As Obama said, we're no longer a Christian nation. 
were a nation of multi-religious people, and really these secular economists and these secular professors in these universities are saying, oh, Christianity had nothing to do with the prosperity of a, of a nation, of America. It was man's inventiveness. It was man's initiative. It was man's lust. It was man's desire, his evil desire to conquer the West. It was man's greed to go dig gold and silver out of the Rocky Mountains. You see, they say in everything concerning man. If you've never heard this, this is what they're saying. And they're mocking Christians who says, God blessed this nation in the beginning. See, it was the Lord that brought e Israel out of Egypt. But later on, they built two calves and said, these are our gods. And that's why Jer Jeremiah said, a nation has changed their gods. You see, when, when, you, when you hear these politicians that are running for the office of the presidency, they may say, God bless, but what God are they referring to? They're not referring to the God of the Bible, who is Jesus Christ. They're referring to just anything and everything, polytheism, many gods. It's whatever you think is your God, let Him bless you. And they never mention the blessings of Jesus Christ on early America because they say, well, it's man's ingenuity. It's man's initiative. It's man's greed or his lust to build this, build the railroad, build the highways, to improve technology, to invent things, all that. The blessing of God has nothing to do with that. It's just man, 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 secular humanism. Well, let's move on. In chapter 8 of this book and verse number 10. Chapter 8, verse 10. It says, Therefore will I give their wives unto others, hmm. and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From, a, from the prophet even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. He's talking about the priest and the prophets. Those were the religious leaders of the day. And they're given over to being covetous. Would that involve in any way this so-called gospel of prosperity? If you watch some of these prosperity preachers, man, there's not a Stetson in Texas big enough to fit their head. They brag about their beautiful colonial homes, their long driveways, their gated property, and their uh, multi-million dollar possessions, airplanes, motorcycles, boats flying around the world in the latest private jets and bragging about it. Does this mean that in that day the priests and the prophets, the priests were those that were given the responsibility to function at the altar. They were to function at the altar. 
and they were covetous. How were they covetous? By doing the same things that the sons of Eli did, by taking parts of the animal that was not allotted to them. They took more than their share. Or they were selling animals at an exorbitant price. They were selling sacrificial animals and making a profit. And then the prophets were running around town. They were definitely prophets for profit. And they were prophesying good. And they were saying this, don't worry about Babylon invading Jerusalem. Everything is going to be all right. Peace, peace, when there was no peace. That was their cry. And two prophets that were named teamed up against Jeremiah. They, they actually came out against him. And because he was prophesying captivity, they were prophesying peace. Well, the leadership of the city of Jerusalem would love to hear uh, the message of peace. No fellows, no wonder why these fellows were getting rich. And it seems as though in our day that the gospel will make you rich if you preach the right words, but it's really not the gospel. It's the gospel of greed. It's the gospel of greed. Now, I'm not going to name names. I don't have to. But folks, don't get sucked in to the so-called prosperity gospel where everything is, I am enjoying my heaven, my blessing, my prosperity here on earth. Every one of those men that preach that, whether it be your pastor or the biggies on TV, one of these days they're going to be rolled down the aisle just like everybody else. And six men's going to carry them to their grave. It won't last. But you see how the book of Jeremiah is so relevant to our day. So Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11, For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah is saying the Babylonian army is coming because of our iniquities and those greedy false priests and false prophets were saying, don't worry, everything is hunky-dory, everything is just fine, we're going to fly away in the rapture. Everything, I'm going to have prosperity right now, and then when Jesus comes, I'm going to fly away in the rapture. No, it's not going to happen that way, folks. I'm convinced there's persecution coming to the true body of Christ in this nation. And the institutionalized, organized, homogenized, pasteurized, monetized church in America is going to be part of the persecutors of the true body of Christ, because they will compromise. They will compromise. But the true body of Christ, someday, I predict, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, so I'm not prophesying, I'm just predicting that the true body of Christ will meet in, quote, the caves and the dens of the earth, meet in little storefronts or in someone's home or in a basement somewhere, or in the back of a warehouse, just like they're doing in China, and just like they did in Soviet Russia. 
That's where they met in secret. That's where they're meeting, I understand, in China today. In the back rooms. They're sincere. And when they meet, they don't just have an opening prayer, three songs, a uh, pavilion type sermon, and go home. They stay there for six and eight hours worshiping God and enjoying the company of other saints. The American church, I've said it for 30 years, the American church generally has too much money. And too much money causes too much comfort. Too much money. Too much comfort. And when a preacher has too much money from the ministry, then he becomes a hireling. A hireling. He's hired. But folks, you didn't hire me, so you can't fire me. That's the way my philosophy is. The Lord set me free from organized religion over 40 years ago. It was painful at the time, but it was the best thing that he ever did. Hallelujah. Let's move on. In chapter 4 of this book, we read, starting in verse number 19, chapter 4, verse 19, Jeremiah's distress over the social, spiritual, political, cultural conditions of his day. Folks, if you are not disturbed over what you see in America, there's something wrong with your vision. There's something wrong with your faith. There's something wrong with your spirit. You have grown used to the dark because the darkness comes on gradually and you just go with the flow and pretty soon you love the darkness. Jeremiah 4, 19, he says, My bowels, in other words, the very center of his emotions, he said, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. There's war on the horizon for America, my friends. I don't know when, where, or how, but there's an alarm that's being sounded. War could break out overnight with all the technology and the sophisticated equipment and war material that we possess and other nations possess. And I believe that some of our congressmen and senators are actually warning war. I think some of them actually relish in it. And the military industrial complex that General slash President Dwight David Eisenhower told us about is upon us because they make a profit. And one Marine general, forget his name, he said war is a racket. It's a money-making racket, just like gambling, but it brings better returns. People became millionaires. Industrialists became millionaires in World War I. 
World War II. They relished. They didn't care who won. The bankers, the Rothschild bankers, raking in the millions. They even won during the Napoleonic Wars when Mayor Amschel Rothschild observed the Battle of Waterloo and he cashed in on the stock in London. He knew what he was doing. Men have become millionaires and corporations have become billionaires. Vietnam War, the Gulf Wars, the war on terrorism. They love it. So war is all around us. And Jeremiah was disturbed because of the sounds of war. He said, destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard or the flag and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish, an old Anglo-Saxon word that's in the King James Bible, which means they're drunken. They're in a stupor. They can't think straight. They can't reason properly. They can't delineate. They cannot Think logically. They're sottish. They're in a stupor, a drunken stupor. And therefore they make foolish mistakes. And they have done, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Folks, This book that I'm reading from, I could go in a series of ten programs on describing the evils of the day in which Jeremiah lives, which are parallel to our day. Some of the things, it says, they have no understanding. The people were sottish or drunken as in a stupor. If you will listen to some of the decisions that's coming out of our federal courts, those judges are like in a stupor. They're sottish. They're drunk on their own humanistic understanding. As the prophet said, they have not known the Lord. If you listen to some of the words that's coming out of the Washington, D.C., out of the Capitol, some of the statements that those congressmen and senators are making, you would think that they were an uneducated lot of people that just came out from under a rock somewhere, and bringing our nation into a state of more debt, tolerating sin, engaging in political corruption, and that's all we've heard for the last three years is political corruption, but it seems to be on the Democratic side more than on the Republican side. Who can we believe? Have we lost the quality of leadership? Are there no more statesmen out there throughout the country to go to Washington with sensibility and with concern for the nation and not just the next political campaign and the next political election? God help us. But you see how 
Jeremiah described the people of his day and the whole complex of his nation fits America perfectly today. Folks, we could go on through this book for many programs describing the moral degradation of the day of Jeremiah, which is even surpassed in our day in America. God help us once again. But we have gone so far that I'm afraid we've gone past the point of no return as far as a nation. But the Lord knows His people. The Lord knows the body of Christ. He knows His people. He, he knows His elect. And He's going to protect His elect, even during times of persecution. I'm not saying that there won't be any bloodshed. There may be what they call red martyrdom and white martyrdom. In other words, red is people are killed, white martyrdom, people are abused or imprisoned or something like that. But the Lord knows His own. But there is destruction coming to this nation. 9-11 was nothing in comparison to what God is going to allow to happen in this nation to wake us up. It's going to be a biggie. I mean something huge, like shutting off of the electrical grid or something that might get our attention. But we'll see. We have a magazine here called Truth and History. If you've never received one, we will be more than happy to send you this free of charge. If you don't like it, call us up. Tell us to take your name off the mailing list. No offense. But I want to encourage you to go to YouTube, then punch in Truth and History, and you will find a lot more material there. Go to our website, truthandhistory.org and a lot more material there, some videos, etc., that are very helpful. And folks, our ministry is not to amass money or popularity, but to cry out against the sins of our nation that we should return unto our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because there is no hiding place down here outside of the shelter and the Ark of the Lord Jesus. For any material offered on this program, or to be a part of this ministry, please write or call today. We thank you, and may God bless you for your response to this end-time ministry. Truth in History 